Hello and welcome to the November 2024 Big Fix Briefing Room. My name is Michelle McGough and I'm here with Joe Saylor. And let's cover today's agenda. So we'll start off with the Microsoft Patch Tuesday overview. Uh, we've got a note on AI and security. Uh, Linux print services are under fire this month and we've got a new release of Big Fix to talk to you about. Joe, do you want to get us started on Microsoft? Yeah, of course. Uh, so your quick overview by the numbers here, uh, we've got 89 total CVEs closed. Uh, there are four zero days, uh, two of which are being actively exploited. Uh, and we have released about 330 fixlets to resolve all of the various vulnerabilities this month. Okay. Um, oh, it looks like you've got some zero days that you've called out and I can see the first one there. The score looks a little low, so I'm curious what you have to say. Yeah, this whole month uh, to me is really characterized by like showcasing the shortcomings of the CVSS rating system. You know, it's just a, a, a series of specific attributes of the vulnerability, and then they're just kind of mathematically added together. Uh, but to me, uh, that really kind of falls over in certain cases, like this one right here. Um, our first vulnerability is in all Windows platforms. Uh, and essentially how it works is if you have a malicious file on your system, it can be a very small one. Uh, you know, they're obviously specially crafted. Uh, and remember, this is actively exploited. So files exist out there today that do this. Uh, if you left click the file, the attacker can take your account. They can authenticate as your account. So you don't do anything with the file. Don't open it. Um, any, any interaction at all, like a left click, a right click, and they can log in as you. Uh, and as a 6.5, you know, typically most people would kind of pass over it if you're just looking by the numbers. Uh, but to me, this is crazy threatening because uh, it gives attackers a foothold to kind of, you know, put together an attack chain where, you know, maybe this doesn't give them access to run code on your box. But once you have a user logged in, there are a thousand different CVEs that you can exploit to actually gain control and do all sorts of nefarious things. So this as an entry point uh, circumvents all of those like user security, user training tools that we have to like not get fished and not run uh, suspicious files. Uh, it just circumvents all of that. Uh, so it's to me, this is way more threatening than a 6.5. You would think a 6.5 would be. And the reason for the low score I mean, um, I've, I've heard you say in the past, like, uh, I, I don't get out of bed for a six. There's so many sixes out there and they usually require a significant amount of user interaction and access and um, they're difficult to exploit. Now, this one does require user interaction, but not very much. And that's- Yeah, not very much. And in a way that you never think of as something that is threatening okay. to do. Like I do not think of clicking, left clicking on a file, not opening it, not doing anything at all with it. I don't think of that as a user as a threatening action to take. And so that circumvents, you know, all of the like your, your mental um, ability to evade this kind of malicious stuff as a user. Okay. Uh, yeah, that it, is sorry, that's alarming to me. Very alarming. Yeah. Uh, so that's our first mismatch. Um, the second uh, item is also a little bit of a mismatch. Uh, to me, it's you know an 8.8 .8 rating, but it um, requires an attacker to already be logged in and to interact with the Windows Task Scheduler. Uh, so this allows an attacker to elevate from like a standard user to uh, a medium privileged RPC user on the box, a remote procedure call user. Uh, so you know when you already have access to a box, like for instance with our first CVE. You can then you know elevate to do whatever else you want through the windows task scheduler and again this uh vulnerability is on all all windows versions okay thanks joe are there more of these mismatches this month yeah we got all sorts of mismatches coming so buckle up okay. wow there we go click too many times uh, okay, so uh, speaking of mismatches, um, there was a 9.9 .9 in Azure Cycle Cloud that came out, which you know typically you would think of as the apocalypse. Um, that's a that's about as high as it gets, right? 
Uh, yeah. But to me, this wasn't quite as threatening. Uh, first off, Cycle Cloud is the uh, high performance compute uh, version of Azure. Uh, so this is, um, you know, not something that like every user would have access to. And the requirements to exploit this are that you have a login to your Azure Cycle Cloud. Uh, so this allows a basic user to transition to root access. Uh, and then of course, you know, run remote code or whatever else they want from there. Um, that barrier to entry to have an account for what is presumably a pretty tightly controlled environment. Um, you know, these high performance compute environments aren't typically accessed by thousands and thousands of users, right? You have probably just a few talking to them. Uh, and so, yes, the consequences for exploitation are pretty high, but the barrier to entry is also high. Uh, and this also doesn't take into uh, consideration the temporal fact that, um, you know, for for cloud resources like this, every vulnerability is essentially kind of a reverse zero day. So this vulnerability was disclosed, you know, patch Tuesday, a couple of days ago, and it was resolved the same day because it's in, it, like it's in Microsoft's cloud, it's in their control, right? So the yeah. day they disclose it is the day they close the vulnerability. And all of our risk comes from the disclosure date to the date you actually close the vulnerability in your, in your environment, right. which for you know some boxes can be months, can be years if you can't get to them or if something errors out. Uh, so that's where the real risk is. And then with the you know with Azure, those risks go away immediately, and attackers don't have the time to like develop an attack strategy to get this basic access that would need. Uh, and so just temporarily, it is not as threatening as that 9.9 .9 would lead you to believe. I agree with you, although I will say, not specific to this one, but there is a period of time between when a vulnerability is discovered and when it's disclosed. And sometimes there um, is a significant delay in there as well, which is something we saw last month. Um, so that's that's maybe a topic we can come back to in another month. But I, I, agree, I agree with you, once it's disclosed, there is usually that race condition that you've brought up before where everybody's trying to then um, take advantage of it while they can, while that vulnerability is is out there. Yeah, it's you versus the clock in most of these cases, for sure. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, what it, um, the statistic that we talk about a lot is it takes, uh, the average organization out there takes 60 days to close a vulnerability and attackers can usually exploit them within 30. <laughs> on that, average, uh, yeah. That time where you're vulnerable and they have an exploit ready is uh, that's, that's where right. scariness lives. Uh, okay, so and then uh, for the Microsoft Defender remote code uh, execution exploit, um, I feel like that one's also a little overrated. Microsoft did something really strange with their evaluation here. Um, the vulnerability is that if you have Microsoft Defender, and a user clicks a link, then an attacker with a malicious link can you know, run code on your box, uh, which is not great for sure. Uh, you know, it's a little like, ironic. And, <laughs> yeah, it, right. Yeah, My, the Microsoft Defender doesn't doesn't defend so well. Um, yeah. The thing they did that's really strange here, though, is they have made the assumption that um, you've already you already have an attack chain where a user doesn't have to click it at all. Like specifically in the text of it, they called out that if, you know, you have uh, uh, like a preview pane or something of that nature in your email, and if there is an exploit that will open links without a user clicking on them, then it applies to this somehow. So they set the authentication required to none, or the user action required to, to none, even though it really requires a user to click a link. So, you know, I thought that was a strange way for them to like decide that it should have kind of an artificially higher CVSS score just based on this, you know, idea that we would link it with another vulnerability, which is not usually the case. Usually all vulnerabilities are considered in their own vacuum, which Right. When they're just right, that they're independent, but then you can you can chain them together and Yeah. Um achieve something a little different. But yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if we'll find out. If we'll ever know. No. Yeah, and I wonder if this. I wonder if this will like kind of point to a strategy going forward for CVEs 
from Microsoft, which you know I, I do tend to agree with that uh, the potential for CVs to be linked together should be considered, but the CVSS model doesn't allow for that really. Like the the individual reporting it would have to make guesses based on those interactions. Oh, and the I mean the calculations on it would be explosive. Yeah. And right. kind of infinite because every month you'd have new opportunities and you could leverage those old ones and I Yeah. Well well I'll I'll let I'll let a computer um take care of that. <laughs> okay. So this so one is not are, overrated. Yeah, so those are our overrated ones for the month. Uh we have a couple that are definitely not overrated. Um this one is a vulnerability in .NET and Visual Studio that allows remote code execution. Uh, there is a bit of a mismatch here in terms of desktop application versus server application. Um, this is on a server for any web server running any .NET application. This is for sure a 9.8, like I would say a 10. It is crazy. If you have, if you have any ability to prioritize what is getting patched, and I know web servers are difficult to do because you have to consider compatibility and uptime and all that. Uh, but this one for your .NET application servers is an unauthenticated remote code execution exploit for any server that's stood up right now with .NET installed uh, that's running a .NET web app. Okay. So for the servers, this is nuts. Like you do not want this in your environment. For desktops, it's not nearly as crazy, but it has the same rating because we have to use the maximal rating for it. Um, and again, this is another CVSS limitation in that we're looking at .NET, but not considering where it's installed. Um, so for okay. desktops, a user has to manually load a .NET application. So this is, you know, your, um, your .NET desktop applications will say you have a 9.8 severity vulnerability, but a user has to be tricked into double clicking on something in order to exploit it, which, okay. yeah. you know, to me that the whole, even to get into the nines, like you should really have some sort of reduced user mistake required. And this has no reduced user mistake required for the desktop vulnerability the desktop side. side. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and to say it again, uh, patch your .NET servers, like, great, please, crazy. This is a crazy one. Pause. Go do it. We'll be here when you come back. Yeah. Uh, so, and another couple of things in the not overrated categories, we have another couple of 9.8s in um, the Windows application. So, or, sorry, in, in a couple of Windows applications. So the kernel mode driver has a remote code execution exploited as well as Kerberos authentication. Uh, those are both like commonly run applications on servers, uh, commonly run ser sorry, services on Windows servers. Uh, they are unauthenticated. They are zero user interaction. Uh, any server with these services running are vulnerable to them. Uh, so again, if you have any ability to prioritize patching, like Windows servers should like be moved up if you can, like if there's any room in your process for it. Uh, these these are pretty bad. Okay. Normally, this is where we would talk about the misaligned risk scores, which is, I think, what was maybe on your mind just there. Um, do we have more of these this month that just aren't Microsoft? Yeah, so we're moving on to just some stories that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, we are fortunately done with the kind of big CVEs of the month. Uh, it really struck me, you know, in the last month or two, the just volume of secure AI insecurity stories that have come out. Uh, just a week or so ago, uh, Google released a report that their uh, AI tool that they use to, uh, you know, determine where, where security holes are in their products found a zero day CVE in SQLite and they were able to patch it before they deployed the the new version of SQLite that would have had this remote code execution exploit in it. So it's essentially like they you know they've leveraged AI, they leveraged these language models to just take pen testing to a whole new level. Previously, we would just use fuzzing, which is basically like um, 
when you fire just a bunch of crappy inputs to your application to see if anything unexpected happens, which is automated and a great way to do it. Uh, but this is way more targeted and you know runs at kind of a code level where you don't have to have a user you know decide what inputs we're testing against. It just it did it all. It did it all front to back, uh, which is just you know massive acceleration in terms of securing applications in the pre from the pre-deployment side. So you've got some questions here. Or you've got a question about um, what does this mean for open source? What was your thinking on that? Yeah, so this is a tool that they ran against their repo, the SQLite repo, right? And it just did its thing. They fed a prompt to it, and it, it large language modeled its way to a CVE. Um, once this proliferates and is more available to just people in general, it got me thinking where this would be exploited at, right? It's This isn't a, a thing that hits a closed source executable. It's a thing that hits source code. And we have just a massive number of source codes available out there in the open source community, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and generally, we think of open source as fairly secure, not nefarious, because it's open source and anybody can view them. Uh, but in this case, that means that these AI tools can scan these open source resources for vulnerabilities and find and exploit them in code that's live and in use today. And so there's a little bit of a dark side to this one because now we have now the owners of these repos or just you know uh, people in general that are interested in updating the open source repos, like they would end up having to use these tools before anybody you know with with bad intentions used these same tools. And so it's you know kind of creating a little bit of a race condition here. Yeah, I think um, I thought I saw a headline this month about um, you know malicious actors using AI to discover more vulnerabilities themselves. So it's it's um, it's kind of like like weapons or bullets. You may or may not be in favor of them. Um, but regardless of your take, there's always that flip side that can be proved, right, in practice, where it can be used for positive or negative. Um, and and where you stand on that, where you stand on that also depends on which side you were on to begin with. So it's it's a complicated, it's it's very complicated, but it's not going anywhere. Oh, and right here, <laughs> here we go. This is is this the dark side right here, Joe? Perfect segue. Uh, if I had okay. more time with the graphics, I really wanted that first slide to be kind of angelic and this one to be a little more demonic. Uh, but this, <laughs> so this is, is this the is, basement cat. Is this is that yeah, what this is? Basement this cat? is basement cat here. I okay. uh, yeah. So this is the the flip side to it, right? Um, OpenAI released a report that found that twenty threat groups were abusing their lar large language model to do just nefarious stuff. And the nefarious stuff they were doing is probably more wide than you might imagine. Um, you know, when I first thought of threat groups using a language model to to do things, I was thinking um, just like scanning open source repos for vulnerabilities um, or just creating, you know, uh, supercharging their ability to create code to exploit existing vulnerabilities. That sort of technical side to it is was my first thought. But it turns out they are much more creative than I am. Uh, and it's been used for so many other things already. Um, some of the major things that I was just kind of blindsided on was the social engineering side of it. Uh, so anybody who's taken any sort of you know, user training to, for, for anti-phishing or whatever, like one of the first things they tell you in all those trainings is watch out for misspelled emails, right? Yeah. Like watch out for stuff that just looks yeah. kind of janky. Because uh, that's your first clue that it's wrong and malicious, right? Well, these language models create perfect replicas, perfect copies, stuff that looks exactly legitimate for email phishing. So all of that stuff, just as a result of these LLMs, gets way more believable. It would be mm -hmm. way harder to tell as these kind of proliferate through the, through the Black Hat community. Uh, so that's one part of it. Uh, the other part of it is that they're using these AI tools to just run amok with generating Twitter conversations or just any other social media conversations mm -hmm. with individual targets. So 
you know, a, somebody from a, a threat group will just engage in a conversation with someone and it can go hundreds of exchanges deep. Um, and, you know, it really turns any phishing campaign into like a spear phishing campaign. So, you know, the much more targeted um, ways that we see attackers hit like higher value targets now applies to lower value targets as well. Uh, so the complex mm -hmm. um, campaigns they might use to go whale fishing, you know, looking for CEOs or really high value targets, all those tools uh, from data harvesting off of like LinkedIn or the internet in general or Facebook, whatever, for their individual targets now applies to just your random rank and file worker as well. So, you know, this stuff is just getting more and more aggressive, more and more believable. I was just, I was kind of, I was kind of thinking why, you know, why would anybody waste time on a lower value target? But it's because they can, they can scale it very easily so effectively it, it doesn't matter there's value to them if they have a successful attack really at any level yeah and earlier in in this deck we saw a vulnerability in um in azure where a lower level user can, that's right yeah can escalate to root admin on the entire instance and so you know these lower level users especially as they get just like a catalog of compromised users they don't necessarily need to use them right away, right? Like you can compromise user and just sit on the credentials for a little bit, wait for a good opportunity. Uh, and this just makes it automated and, and way more possible, way more successful. Okay. So you just have to be more vigilant, just more and more and more vigilant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one more, to do. <laughs> one more little bit of nightmare fuel to consider is that, you know, as they're using uh, code creation tools in these uh, large language models. Uh, all of these vulnerabilities we talk about are not net new. So every CVE right. that we talked about today didn't get created as a result of the October or July or any you know anything in 2024 patches. They existed since the dawn of time. And so as uh, attackers are more able to identify these vulnerabilities themselves, uh, you know, we'll find things that have existed forever and suddenly are being used because we have these, you know, amazingly powerful automated tools to find them. I know this seg segment's getting long, but I, I think it's worth asking. It, you know, if this can be used negatively, we just have to remember the previous slide. This can also be used for the powers of good. I mean, does this mean that any any vendor could start using LLMs to enhance the pen testing that they're doing today on their own products to look for um, vulnerabilities and identify them and resolve them as soon as possible. Um, I mean, basically, how, how do you fight back against this? Yeah, I mean, it's early days. The, the Google story, Google AI, AI story was the first confirmed CVE that's been resolved purely through AI. So early days. Uh, my expectation mm -hmm. is that this will change what a secure build framework looks like uh, you know we will likely end up needing on the build side these automated tools these you know ai automated tools in place obviously we already use plenty of automated tools for code security uh, but feeding it through large language models like this will i think is going to end up being a mandatory step uh, i worry that smaller publishing houses will have trouble implementing it uh, depending on, you know, like, is Google going to provide this for free? Is OpenAI going to provide something for free? You know, who knows how that's going to shake out. Uh, it's definitely going to end up being just an even faster arms race than we're kind of used to seeing. Okay. Well, I think we sort of saw this coming. Yeah. So here it is. <laughs> it's the, the inevitable acceleration. Oh, so, okay, here we go. We're going into Linux, and I am so pleased to say that after what you taught us last time, I actually know <laughs> what that segment at the bottom is all about. So uh, this is cool. So it's a 9.1. That's pretty high for Linux. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, this uh, just continues the chain of there being nines every month for Linux. Um, yeah. you know, in past years, it's yeah. been very quiet, you know, nothing particularly nasty. They all always require some sort of local login, uh, but there's just been a chain of network vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel. 
Uh, this one for this month is specifically in the IPv6 stack. So any Linux server with uh, IPv6 hosting enabled will be affected. Uh, it is in the TCP header, which essentially just allows uh, attackers to leak data. Like they can see privileged data. Um, you'll note uh, we have the, you know, the breakdown of the CVSS score here. Uh, I wanted to highlight that in the integrity uh, line is set to none. Uh, that means that there's the attacker doesn't have the ability to do anything to the application. So there's no remote code execution. Uh, there's no crashing, uh, Not sorry, not crashing. There's uh, no ability to modify what other users see, that sort of thing. Uh, but what it does do is allow attackers to snoop data, which is really, really bad. <laughs> it's not, not something <laughs> yeah. you want to you wanna have uh, just leaked out of yeah. there, like all your traffic. Um, and it to me, uh, this hasn't been really confirmed, but the availability line is set to high, which to me says that they expect this can be used as a denial of service attack as well. So that's okay. probably, you know, th those two things are the biggest threat here. Uh, again, if you have any ability in your process to move stuff forward uh, in, in time for patching, this is one of those things that you should be dealing with pretty much immediately. Okay, thanks, Joe. Oh, this is, so this was out, we didn't record last month for the briefing room, um, but this was, I think, out just when we were about to record. And yeah, so we're, uh, yeah, I'm a few weeks late on this one, but uh, it's yeah. actually one of our bigger releases. It's a point release, which you would normally think of as not huge, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, and as kind of the resident scaling nerd here, uh, it has a lot of things that weren't even in the release notes, which to me were really exciting. Um, of course, go to the forums, check out the uh, Big Fix 11 patch three release announcement for the big hits. Uh, but all of these things kind of aren't in there and really interest me. Like there's a lot of uh, cleanup tools. There's a lot of uh, log message removal uh, that happens in 1103. Uh, like for instance, uh, relay sites are now able, relays are now able to clean up stuff that they have gathered that isn't being used. Uh, in an automated way, uh, we can clean up files that clients have uploaded and you haven't used in a long time in an automated way. Uh, we have console performance improvements, which really excites me. I love to see performance uh, performance improvements in the core platform. Uh, there's also something that uh, you know, in, unless you are using a lot of API calls, this may not interest you so much. It's pretty high level big fix stuff. But in Big Fix Explorer, we now have this new concept of discrete filters for session relevance. Uh, so if you've ever like written any session That's, relevance and tried to yeah. filter data, you've used, you've made a session relevant statement that is 2000 lines, lines long, yep. has over, has <laughs> over 9,000 parentheses in it as you try and filter stuff down. And this whole, this new concept allows you to create a discrete filter uh, like a simple relevant statement, you know, uh, Bez computers whose name of it is Michelle and apply that to any of your other session relevant statements that gather yeah. data and, and you would only return, you know, Michelle's computer data, which is a great new concept. It's sort of like, uh, you know, how you manually apply filters in web reports today. So it's going to really simplify like how you gather data through the API once this, you know, prol proliferates and, and gets used out in the world. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. The product training on this release was like two and a half hours or something. It was, or, yeah, it was like for a point not. release. And I saw that in there. The other thing that I saw that's not on this, I mean, the list is so long, there's no way we could even fit a quarter of what was in there onto a slide like this. Um, but I really enjoyed the um, the introduction for the new commands um, that we're offering for multi-cloud management. So, yeah, in, so those of you, we, what we found in our customer base is that for people who are using um, cloud, most organizations are using more than one public cloud. So, you know, they're not just all committed to Azure or Google, like they're kind of hedging their bets for some reason. And so we think about making content for um, you know, to manage to manage VMs, provision them, configure them, turn them off and on. Um, 
the thought of like creating content for two different <laughs> cloud providers just seem kind of crazy, I guess. So they they came up with um, common language for the action script command. So I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, excited exactly. to work with customers to use it. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I'll, I'll I'll stop with that. This this is a good release. You should really look at it. Um, definitely upgrade to this version. Um, there's some um, you know bug fixes and little things in there too. So if you have any cases open or ideas open, you might want to take a look at that. If you're one of my customers in CEE, I'd love to have a session with you so we can talk about it. Um, and that's it. This is a good month, Joe. Um, I think I think what you're bringing home about what's going on with the LLMs and also the um, the more common mismatches and CVSS scores. I think I think we're going to see more of that, and I'm curious how that's going to unfold going into next year. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Joe, thank you, as always, and we'll see you all next month.